like to introduce you all to Felix later. Felix is a director of detection technology at Blue Coat, where he leads the detection technology research team. Taking things apart has been a lifetime passion for Felix. His hobbies, like collecting bugs and malware and botnet takeovers, have resulted in successful takedowns of large malicious networks. And as a member of the HoneyNet project, he is heavily involved in open source security and has been instrumental in developing a number of malware analysis solutions, like uh, the Cuckoo Box, Norman's Malware Analyzer, G2, and Blue Coat's MAA. So without any further ado, a warm welcome for Felix Letter, who will be talking about bug hunting on the dark side. Thank you, Jim. Um, so how was lunch? Was it good? So Italian food is so fantastic. Uh, I hope that um, it doesn't pay its toll and that you fall asleep halfway through the presentation. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. My name is Felix Leder, and uh, I work at Blue Coat. I work with a fantastic team of researchers there, which um, are on a daily basis looking at targeted attacks and all kinds of other malware. And they try to find new methods that are used and trends that are coming up. And uh, then they conclude new detection technologies from that that go into our products. And the common scenario that we have uh, in a lot of days is um, we get a malware sample and somebody says, you know what, this malware runs fine in your Windows 7 system, but in your Windows 10, and Windows 10 system, it doesn't run at all. And then we look more closely and the guys spend a lot of time reverse engineering the malware sample, trying to find out what's wrong, do they have some special evasion and stuff like that. And very often nowadays the conclusion is, I, we found a bug in this malware. <laughs> so our, our systems work fine then, but it's, um, it took like two days to find out that somebody else had a bug in their malware. And um, that's basically already the conclusion of the talk. You can leave now after the slide if you think you already got the message. Um, the point is everybody makes mistakes. I make mistakes. Not sure if you guys make mistakes, but um, a lot of coders make mistakes, and also the malware authors, they make mistakes. Uh, definitely the guys in the front here, they don't make mistakes, I know them. <laughs> so I want to give you some examples how malware authors make mistakes, and that actually has an impact. So the first example is from, from 2011. Um, it's from a rogue AV software. Basically, it um, pretends that you have an infection on your computer. It wants you to buy the full version. And uh, then they make money out of you without really being infected, except of this best antivirus solution. And it had um, a check in there if it's running in a virtual machine. You know, malware analysts, they very often run malware in, in a virtual machine. And they say we don't expose the full feature set if we are running in a virtual machine so that the researchers don't find out what we are capable of doing. Only high level stuff. And um, there's an Intel instruction, it's called get CPU ID. Can you guys actually read that? It's even hard to read from the front here. So it's, it's, uh, it's not like, uh, yeah, very clear. So at the top right, you basically see the assembly that we got out of the malware, um, get CPU ID, and there's a flag that you get. And if this flag has the topmost bit set, it basically means that you're running in a hardware virtualized system. We've also um, put the pseudocode in C down here at the bottom. Do we have any C coders in the room? Okay. So please have a closer look at um, the ch comparison with the flag that's down there. If you know how to do comparisons in C, you know you have to use two equal signs. So they are doing an assignment. The result is they always think that they are running in a virtual machine and they will never use the full feature set. <laughs> um, another example, and actually um, I was standing next to a guy over lunch and he said, well, that was a good time before I became a manager and that was a reverse engineering configure. Um, configure, that was really a big thing. Um, who, who remembers configure? Okay, you can definitely write on your CV you have been in uh, information security for more than five years. Um, Configure was really big. It infected millions of devices. For example, the flight plan database of um, the French Air Force. And also the British Navy was infected. The British Navy had two devices only infected. Uh, does anybody remember the two devices that the British Navy had infected? <laughs> they had two aircraft carriers infected. The reason why uh, Configure was so successful was it was, had a worm-like functionality and it was exp um, 
yeah, exploiting an SMB bug, you know, in Microsoft SMB. Um, 08, 067, that's still around. <laughs> See some people smiling, they still know that bug. So uh, it um, basically configure was generating a random IP address. You see it's using the Windows rand function for the lower word and then also for the higher word. And then they had the next IP address. What they didn't do was to look in the documentation. Because if you look at the documentation for the rand function, it says it will return a number between zero and rand max. And if you read a little bit further in the documentation, you will find out that actually the rand function only goes to seven FFF. So it's not using all of the bits that are actually available. The reason for that function is they don't want to have signedness by accident. But the point is, Configure infected up to like eight million systems in the world, but it was only like a fourth of what they could have infected. <laughs> and I know some um, security officers that say, well, we never had a problem with Configure. And the uh, standard response <laughs> usually is, okay. You probably have an IP address in the right range. Um, who remembers Stuxnet? Okay, wow. A lot of people. So Stuxnet had an installation routine, and they wanted to make sure that they only run and install on supported platforms. And that was the Windows uh, major version 5 or 6. So in order to say, well, it's 5 or 6, they basically do the check larger or equal than five, and lower or equal than six, right? The problem is somebody had a typo in there, and instead of and, they used or. So think about it, smaller than six or larger than five. That's pretty much all versions. The only thing that saved them is that they were checking for NT systems, otherwise, Stuxnet might have been discovered even before it was properly used, you know? So even in APTs, you find crazy stuff. Everybody makes mistakes. Okay, these were just some examples to get started. Um, very often you can really use these things to turn the tables on the attacker, to put them in, into a defensive position. You don't have to wait for them to attack you and then hope that you get, him, get them out of the network. You can really do stuff against them. Let's again start very simple on some very uh, simple stuff to illustrate attribution, for example. Um, this is a standard PayPal phishing email. Um, it's very hard to read. Just believe me, it's PayPal phishing, okay? Um, and it's in German, and you probably all have had phishing emails where you found something in a very strange language, something in Norwegian, something in French, and oh, it was somehow not a real person writing that, right? So in this case, they did the same thing. Uh, it was strange, and uh, we found out it was a copy and paste. It was a copy and paste, and that's the thing that you can't read now. They also copy and pasted the Google Translate link from the bottom of the page. <laughs> it was uh, Google in French, so it's probably a French-speaking adversary in that case. Um, similar example of a rootkit that we took apart, and when we analyzed it, we triggered some error conditions, and then in the debug log, we found a nice message at the top. It said, it says, what is problem? What is problem? There's something missing. There's an article mis missing. Like um, most native speakers would say, what is the problem? What's the problem? So that gives an indication that this, this might be an Eastern European actor writing this because they usually don't use articles. Another example in the same um, direction is, is Kilios. Kilios was a very sophisticated botnet, um, mostly used for spam DDoS attacks, but it had like a multi-tier, like a peer-to-peer -peer style architecture. And it was um, very hard to analyze until we found a command line switch which said slash logs 99. And suddenly it would pop up a new window explaining in very detail everything it did, which files were opened, which IP addresses contacted, which functions were called, what did the functions do? This was better than any sandbox report you can get about this malware. It helped taking apart the whole thing in no time. Energetic Bear, there we already knew where it was coming from. Um, it's a campaign against, against the energy sector. Um, SCADA malware, if you want to have a buzzword. Um, 
And basically, they were trying to get all kinds of information about um, how energy companies work, um, get documentation for them that they can use in, in future attacks. And all data that was exfiltrated, they wanted to make sure that it doesn't show up in any DLP systems, also logs that they send out and data they exchange that nobody can look at it. So they used RSA encryption. Makes perfect sense, right? You only put one key on the system, one in the server, and nobody can read it. D do you all know, understand RSA, and have you heard about asymmetric cryptography? See some heads shaking, some heads nodding. Okay, let me quickly explain the, the, the concept. Um, basically, asymmetric crypt cryptography means you need to have two keys, one for encryption and one for decryption. If you only have one of the keys, you, cannot, you can only encrypt, but you cannot decrypt. So in this scenario, basically, the infected laptop has the public key, for example, then data is transferred to the bad guys who only have the private key, and there they can decrypt and get the original document back. And no DLP system on the wire can actually find out what was transferred. The beauty of RSA is you can actually exchange the keys and achieve the same thing. You can also use the private key to encrypt and the public key then later to decrypt. And uh, they have chosen the later, um, the, the attackers here, the malware authors. There's one problem. And the problem is that some crypto libraries, when you export the private key, they not only export the private key, but they also include the public key by default. So that's what happened here. And that basically meant every infected laptop not only had the encryption key, they also had the decryption key. So if you had a good team of coders, you could actually add this, um, this key to your DLP solution and then find out what's, uh, what's actually going over the wire. So these were some examples about information disclosure. Um, I also want to show you some examples how you can actually use bugs and um, use them as vulnerabilities against the malware. So now, um, this is for the veterans. Who remembers the storm botnet? Yeah, can I get some hands? Oh, okay, that's the guys with 10 plus years experience in information security. Storm was a very tough one because it used only peer-to-peer -peer technology to give commands. That means um, you can never find out where actually the commands come from. Um, it was very hard to take down. Um, some people believed it would be impossible. Storm um, also used an HTTP component to fetch updates and so on. And for that, it used a hard-coded user agent. So have a look if you find anything strange about that user agent. They have a typo in there. It says Windows, not Windows. <laughs> Windows. So you can imagine it was quite easy to write an IDS rule so that you could detect storm on the wire. Um, that botnet went down, but the same guys created a new version of storm two years later where they came back and they obviously looked at the IDS rules because they found out they were detected by the user agent string and they changed it. So you can see they just removed some numbers at the very end, but they kept the window. So you can imagine how hard it was to actually adjust the rule and uh, create a new IDS rule for that one. <coughs> Here's another APT example, um, Sikipot. Um, Sikipot is actually quite sophisticated in what it's doing and how it's spreading. If you are a valuable target, they really use like proper zero days, you know, like really expensive, hard to get stuff against you. Um, so that means as a private user, you will most likely never ever see it, but if you're like a big company, um, you might actually get infected by Sikipod. And um, the nice thing is if you look at Sikipod, again, there's a command line switch, and the command line switch is remove KYS. They want to make sure that they have the functionality in there that it can also be removed in case they get discovered. The beauty of it is if you just know the command line switch, you can uninfect and uninstall the malware yourself. So think about this. It's very kind of them to actually add this functionality. So we're jumping a bit um, in history. Here's something rather recent, um, ransomware. You know, everybody is, is afraid of ransomware nowadays. 
um, because it basically encrypts all the files on your disk and then you only get it back for a, ran a ransom. And this was one of the first ransomwares for Android. It said that you had child pornography on your phone and uh, you have to pay something within 24 hours or charges will be made against you. Um, it was also quite sophisticated as it has a Tor hidden service for command and control, so it wasn't really easy to find out where that command and control server is sitting. And uh, we had one of our analysts looking at this in more detail and not sure how it happened, but he infected himself with his phone. And he called me and said, Felix, I've got a problem. I've got some hot party pictures from last weekend and family photos from the last two years. They're all encrypted now. I can't get them back. And uh, then we looked together a little bit about how SimpleLocker is actually encrypting the files and asking for a ransom. And um, w we found a class called Files Encryptor. And in there we found it's using AES. Military grade encryption. Right? Base 64? No, no. A AES. Military grade encryption, as it's often called. Um, it's symmetric. So we talked about RSA before, where you need two different key pairs. Now we have symmetric, which means you use the same key for encryption for decryption. And what was so nice of them was they included a hard coded key <laughs> in the executable. It's hard to read, but basically there's a function called AES encrypt, and there's a string in there. It's kind of random, the string, but it's hard-coded for every vic victim. And what's even better, they also include a decrypt function. <laughs> so our analyst just had to create, take this class file, or in this case, dex file, wrap his own application around it, and he was able to get all his files back. Whew. Lucky. But think about it, this. They ruined their whole business model with this problem because their business model was to make money out of an encryption that nobody can break. Okay, that was just the beginning. Um, now I wanna give you some examples where mistakes really can ruin everything. Who knows Zeus? Anybody admitting that they have ever been infected with Zeus? No, hands down. <laughs> Zeus is one of the most famous banking Trojans that's out there. Um, still exist in a few variants. And when you find command and control servers of Zeus, it's always worth to check like an, a, a few common, common strings, URLs, like for example, slash PHP MyAdmin. So in one of the drop zones, we found that actually they had PHP MyAdmin and they forgot to set a root password, which means you had root access to the full database via the, this URL. And so we were able to look inside, we were able to find out who was infected, which credit card data was, was stolen, which banking credentials were taken, and so on. And we also found a database that was called um, CP Users, which contains the admin credentials. Um, so the beauty of that is, a few months later they locked down the database. They found the PHP My Admin stuff, and basically nobody was able to access that anymore. But the password was just MD5, and it was so simple that it was actually able to, we were able to Google it. <laughs> Do we have Italians in the room? Any Italians? Okay, very good. The password is stronzone. So um, <laughs> since nobody does not understands Italian, that's not a problem to say it here. Another banking Trojan that also had some problems, and now we really come into the classical OWASP field. Yaloodle, typical man in the browser, but actually quite cool, because for example, they were faking your account information in the browser. So let's say they transferred $2,000 from your account to Russia. Afterwards, they were still showing that you had the right balance on your account. So that was pretty cool, your browser, so you had to switch machines in order to actually see the difference, right? As long as you were in the infected machine, you saw the right balance on your account. And as in the case with a uh, Zeus before, when you have access to the command and control server, uh, you can also get access to the source code of the backend sometimes. And um, that's what some guys did, it wasn't us, it was somebody else, the link is down there, will be in the slides later. Um, and if you look at the, com the co um, command and control server code, you see on the left side all the different input parameters that they take. 
And you also see that they do sanitization, right? That's on the right where you see all kinds of regular ex expressions, replacing tokens and so on. So they are doing it right, they are doing sanitization, but what you are seeing is the full source code. You see the full source code for the parameters and you see the full source code for the sanitization. If you look at the left side, you see there are 13 parameters and they are sanitizing two of the parameters. And that actually creates wonderful SQL injections that you can use to exploit the command and control server. Isn't that nice? But I tell you what, there are also some more advanced people on the market and especially the newcomers, you know, everybody who's coming right from academia, they can do much better. Here's Dendroid. Um, Dendroid was one of the first con malware construction kits for Android. About a year ago, or maybe two years ago, they found out it was actually developed by an intern from FireEye who learned too much at FireEye. Um, but this thing was pretty cool because if you were infected, they could turn on your microphone at any time they wanted to. They could record any phone call, get any text message, and basically, think about this. Do you ever leave your phone in your office when you go to a secret meeting? Most CEOs don't. They bring their mobile phone, and very often the mobile phones are lying on the desk, on the table during meetings. So they have access to your calendar, and they can record voice whenever they want to. So you are bringing your own bugging device to your own meeting, which is then highly confidential. And they have a solution for this bugging. That's nasty, right? Um, but this guy didn't know how much, how much that was worth, and he wanted to have uh, $300 for it. Um, and I tell you, if you buy something like that, you should also do a code audit. Um, let me show you why. Um, who has heard about prepared statements before? Prepared, oh, very good. I, I knew people here would understand prepared statements. Awesome. So um, for the rest, here's an example of a classical SQL injection. Basically, in SQL, when you want to access a database, you create a string, like a text, and you give it to the database, and the database is then like source code reading it and doing some action based on it. And if you add just the right control characters, basically the database is confused, and it can do almost anything you want it to do. Prepared statements are different. In prepared statements, you have like one piece, the prepared statement, which is the logic, like a template, control logic, and you have the actual data on the other hand. I'm sorry, the projector is not showing the optimal picture here. So prepare with a template, and later on give the data to the template, and the database will do its, its magic in order to prevent SQL injections. So this intern at FireEye, he had heard about prepared statements, and he has used them <laughs> by in including the values right into the template, and then later on not giving them as arguments. So he used secured, secure methods in a complete unsecure way, and this way, again, allowing us SQL injections into his backend. Another example, um, one of the more difficult botnets um, has been around for a long time, from 2008 to 2010. It was also like, um, I wouldn't call it peer-to-peer, -peer, but maybe multi-tier architecture. So you had um, several layers of infected machines, so that if you had an infected machine, you would never talk directly to the backend or to one of the proxy nodes. You would most likely talk to one of the infected systems over there. Um, in the middle. And when we looked at this, we, we thought, wouldn't it be awesome to be one of these infected systems in the middle so that we could see all traffic going from the command and control server to the other infected nodes? And then we started reverse engineering that sample a bit, and we found out that if you give it strong bandwidth, no firewalling, and wait for between 45 and 60 minutes, you could actually become such a node in the middle, and then see all traffic. Um, 
if you develop software or re reverse engineer, and you know you have to wait 45 minutes for a build or for trying a different configuration, that sucks, right? Um, you don't want to wait 45 minutes for a build. Sorry for all guys that do. But we found there's a command line switch in there. And this command line switch allowed us to become such a relay node right away. So they added debugging, debugging functionality and never removed it. Beautiful. So when we got there and saw all the traffic, uh, we also saw that uh, it was actually not that easy to break it open. The whole command and control protocol was very thought through. It was all XML, but what's the problem with XML? Yeah, very good points, especially hard to parse. Um, they um, wrote a very, very tiny parser for that. Um, it was just about to serve their purpose. The main problem for them was they wanted to give a lot of commands out. And um, XML is so bloated that you can actually see it right away. So they wanted to make it more efficient. And so they zipped it with bzip. And in order so that nobody can actually snoop on the traffic, they added another military grade encryption on it, AES. And because um, AES traffic is also hard to put in HTTP sessions, they base64 encoded the data. But um, base64 encoding is by nature, there are some special characters that don't go well in specific type of requests that they want to use, which is um, XWW form URL encoded. So they also had to replace a few characters there in order to get there. So the tricky part for a researcher is actually the AES encryption, and they used RSA to exchange the session key. So that's the point where we actually fir at first thought we give up. Um, but before that, we said, okay, let's have a look at the session keys that they are returning. And um, at the bottom here, you see at the very top, do I have a pointer? Yeah. Here you see the session key for January. Here you see the session key for February. Here you see the session key for March, for April, and for May. And this was not just for our infected system. This was for all infected systems in the world. Remember, AES, you need one key to decrypt and encrypt. So even with using AES and RSA, it was still possible to decrypt all the traffic. And we kind of created like a, a small show off for our friends and said, hey, you know, that's using RSA, but we can still decrypt it, all of the traffic. We've broken RSA. Okay, but it, that was just a show off. The point is, you need to think about some facts sometimes when you use cryptography. For example, in Windows, you need to seed every thread that you create. If you don't seed the random number generator of a thread, they will always use the same random number. And then you might also end up with the same key all the time. Uh, in that case, and not anymore, because basically, <laughs> well, even using an IV, they would probably have been the same anyways. Um, so once we were at that stage, we were in the middle, and we were able to decrypt the command and control protocol, we found a download command, and they downloaded pictures. Um, and now there's actually, if you are faint of heart, you know, you have problems with difficult pictures. This is not nice what's coming now. So please close your eyes for two slides. I can tell you when you can open it again, okay? Because it's, it's really, it's, there's not much, there's a lot of skin. So please close your eyes. Um, there was the picture that they sent over. <laughs> U.S. politicians. <laughs> As a reverse engineer, you're interested in the naked truth, nothing but the naked truth, right? And we thought, okay, there's still some material. We want to see what's under his pants. And we found something in there. 
we found a signature that terminated the picture, and underneath where his pen stopped, there was an encoded executable. It was just encoded, nothing encrypted, just a simple XOR one byte. And then combining all these different pieces, like becoming a proxy in the middle, being able to modify all the traffic in the middle because the keys never change, and being able to inject new programs into the flow. That actually allowed for a complete takedown. Um, if you want, ever want to do a takedown, don't do it yourself. It will be illegal. But if you know somebody at Microsoft, they have a great team that's helping you on the legal side. So um, with all of this, we were actually able to take down uh, that botnet, for example, legally, um, not like an underground mission. And uh, then that's why they were gone from February 2010 on. So at the very beginning, we've talked about Configure. Um, and Configure A, they had a very specific thing. You already, we already talked about the IP random number generation, right? Um, they also had a special check in there where they, whenever they generate a random number, first they were checking, is it an intranet IP address? If it is, then don't infect. If it is an external IP address, then look up where the IP address is. And if it's in the Ukraine, don't infect the system. That's interesting, right? So first thought then was, um, oh, maybe they are from the Ukraine. But you probably know the political relationships, right? And it's more likely that it's actually the Russians blaming the Ukrainians. And if you really know the political relationships, you know it will probably be the US blaming the Russians for blaming the Ukrainians. <laughs> if you're a conspiracy theorist, you will blame China for blaming the Americans, for blaming Russia, for blaming the Ukrainians. <laughs> The whole point, how can you use that against somebody? So they were using MaxMind's GUIP database. Who knows MaxMind? Is that well known? Some people. So MaxMind is, a, is probably the company for doing GUIP lookups. They have a database you can download. You can even use it for free um, under certain conditions. And you give it an IP address, and it will tell you where this IP address is most likely in the world. And so Configure downloaded this database from MaxMind. Um, at this time, several million computers were infected, and MaxMind got DDoS like crazy. So they had to take down the database, and they just provided a 404. And then we went to MaxMind and said, hmm, well, your database is down anyways. So can you maybe put up our database here that's telling that um, every IP address in the world is in the Ukraine? <laughs> and he goes, what, in 24 hours they said yes and put it up. And from that point on, it was actually very small. It was just 40 bytes or something. Um, they could also serve it, no more DDoS. And uh, Configure stopped spreading immediately. And actually, we saw the infection numbers going down quite well because there were also some remediation tools. So relying on a third-party library is not always the best idea, <laughs> especially as a malware author. So let, let's summarize what we talked about. Um, usually as a defender, you're kind of in the disadvantaged position because there's an asymmetry. If you only make one mistake, if you forget to close one hole, the attackers can get inside your premise. And that's usually something that scares most defenders. The point is, when they are inside your premise, you can turn the whole thing around. They only have to do one mistake in one piece, and you can spot them. And if they make a bigger mistake, like with their command and control servers, then you can actually fight back, hack back, depending on what your legal department says. But the point is everybody makes mistakes, not only the defenders, also the attackers make mistakes. And you can turn the table based on that. And last but not least, when you look at stuff like this, there's a lot of opportunity to learn also from the bad guys.
Any questions? Let's go. Bring on the questions. Let's do this. Was there anything in the uh, OWASP top 10 that wasn't covered? I saw you had the nice little uh, A1 injection stuff. Oh shit, you noticed. Uh, <laughs> so I, I tried to um, yeah, include something for all of the OWASP top 10 and uh, all the numbers are in there. But actually I think um, I'm not skilled enough to actually rate the things properly. So you will find that actually a lot of the examples don't really map to the categories. <laughs> You caught me. Questions? Um, did you ever take down malware by using buffer overflows or something uh, like this? I'm, I'm asking because it's hard to actually um, yeah, see it from the moral point of view. Uh, if you have malware, maybe infected on a medicine computer or something like this, and then you would use uh, techniques like uh, buffer overflow and maybe they strike. Um, how do you get around these uh, problems? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, let, let me start from a different angle answering that question maybe. So you're saying there are medical systems and um, by disinfecting them, we might actually crash them. Um, in the case of Configure, we were called in the middle of the night by hospitals and were asked to help them because Configure had shut down the life-saving support systems. Um, so their systems were Windows-based. They were in a separate network, separate from the internet, but somebody had taken a USB stick, moved things, so they were infected. And they had a policy that if you enter a password three times incorrectly, they would block the computer, they would lock it down. And uh, in that case, that meant that some of the systems that are used for analysis, for monitoring people and so on, were not accessible anymore because of the malware. So in this case, it's really a trade-off. By disinfecting, yes, you might crash the system, but by letting the malware run freely, you're also letting the system lock down. Um, it's very much an ethical, legal type of question. It's very difficult to answer. And, uh, we have never done without legal support. Um, the one case I mentioned that I like to mention publicly is the one that was backed by Microsoft. Um, a buffer overflows, and since you asked specifically about it, um, Poison Ivy, some uh, researcher found a buffer overflow in the command and control server of Poison Ivy, which is also a construction kit, and um, that can be used. In the end, it doesn't really matter if it's a SQL injection or a buffer overflow. The only thing is a buffer overflow, since it's machine code execution, you might do a little bit worse things. Like um, SQL injections are usually a bit more safer. But if you're a good exploit writer, you can also make your normal buffer overflow exploit just as safe as a SQL injection bug. So that's not really making a big difference. Sorry, long answer for a short question. Questions? Any more questions? A round of applause for Felix, what a wonderful talk. Thank you very much.